Nancy Butler, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it is a pleasure to be with you today. I'm excited to have a nice conversation about staffing issues within organizations. Specifically, we're going to be talking about your system for hiring and anchoring people to your business. Uh, this is always an important topic, uh, but I think particularly right now, uh, the stage that we're in in terms of a really tight labor market and, and organizations trying to attract and retain good people, uh, it's it's of particular importance. And so I'm excited to explore all of this with you today. As we get started, I wanted to share Nancy's bio with everybody. Nancy D. Butler built a business from scratch as a single parent with no other source of income and $2,000 to her name. Uh, she went from there to 200 million in assets under management. After selling her business in 2007, she coaches businesses in different industries, assisting them in providing a better level of service for their clients and customers while increasing their business an average of 200%. Nancy is an international professional motivational speaker and award-winning author with over 35 years of experience managing businesses and helping individuals live happier, more successful lives. Nancy was appointed to delegate, uh, excuse me, Nancy was appointed as a delegate to the United Nations for the Commission on the Status of Women in 2018, 2019, and 2020, attending sessions at the UN with approximately 10,000 women from all over the world coming together to share challenges and solutions to overcome them. And I could go on and on and on so many great things that you've done in your career, Nancy, it's a pleasure to have you. Anything else you would like to share with listeners by way of your background or personal context before we dive I on think, in? I think you got it all. So thank you for that. Okay, well, wonderful. So let's, let's dive right on in. So I know you have a system for hiring and anchoring your people to your business. Um, you've used it in your own business to great success. Do you have you always used that system? Describe what that is. And, you know, is it something you've always had something you've developed over time? And we can really dig into the particulars and how it might apply to other organizations. Okay, the original business that I started that we you had originally uh, talked about in my bio, I had for 25 years. So when I started out, I knew absolutely nothing about anything. And no, I hired the wrong people, the jobs weren't getting done. And through trial and error over time, I started realizing from a business standpoint, but then also from a personal standpoint, as I was raising my children, I think about it this way. We spent, most people spend more of their waking hours at work than with their family, friends, or anything else. And life's too short to go through life working somewhere that you hate what you do. So I've always told my kids, I'd rather see you make less money and be happy than make millions of bucks and be miserable. So I took that same thought process to my own business and utilize that when I was hiring someone. Because if you can hire the right people, they're gonna love their job. And if they love their job, if they love what they do, they're gonna be better at it and they're gonna stay with you longer. So here's how I did this. First, I started with myself. And I was at a point where I was looking to bring in a partner. So I didn't want a clone of me. In order to have the end result that I just described, where you everyone's doing what they love doing and want to stay, I first started with myself and I sat down and figured out all the things I do on a regular basis that I'm good at. And if I did them all day, I could leave at the end of the day feeling energized and excited. Second, what are the things I do all day that I'm good at? but I hate doing them. I only do it because I know I need to. And if I had to do those all day, I'd leave at the end of the day drained and not very happy. And then the third part is what are the things I do because there's no one else to do them. I'm lousy at it and someone else would be better at it. So once I figured that out, I started hiring people and even looking for a partner actually, that was the opposite of me because if they loved and were good at the things I didn't like and I hated doing, and if I could have everyone in my office, which I know is not 100% possible, but try to get there as close as you can, you can have your people 
being the people doing the tasks. And when I say doing the tasks, I'm talking about what their main task is. It doesn't mean that they're never going to do anything else. It's just that's their main job when they come to work every day. But if someone else is out, they're going to have to do that job too. But it's just not their regular everyday job. Once I did that and started hiring people, I when I started interviewing others to bring in, I did the same process with them. What are the things they love doing that they're great at? What are the things they do all the time, but they don't like? And what are the things they're not good at and don't want to do? Because then I could make sure I knew first what was the position I was hiring someone for? What were those tasks? And then by interviewing a person in that way, I could find the right person to plug into the right job. It actually worked really well. I sold the practice in 2007. I saw those people a few years ago, a few, excuse me, a few weeks ago, and they're all still there. And so, and I had hired them about five or six years before I left the practice. So if you get the right people doing the things they love that they're best at, they're going to enjoy coming to work and they're going to stay. Yeah. Yeah. I really like that. And it's not to say, I mean, you, you've alluded to this. It's, it's an ideal that we can strive for uh, to get to that point. Of course, everyone has to do things in their job that they don't necessarily like or they're not as good at. It's, it, that's the nature of it, right? And, and sometimes you just you have to suck it up and you have, everyone has to step to the plate and, and, uh, and contribute, even if it's you know, maybe not their, their main cup of tea. And that's fine. Um, but if that's the predominant um, experience at work where every day you're pretty much spending almost all of your time doing that kind of soul sucking work, um, then there's going to be a problem there. And, and sure. the, th the thing is what's soul sucking for me and for you may be completely different than what's soul sucking for somebody else. And so like work that I can't imagine doing all day, every day, other people love doing all day, every day. Exactly. Right. And so that's, that's part of this finding the alignment and just re having people be self-aware enough to understand what they like, what they enjoy, what they're good at, um, you know, where, how they want to develop, where they want to grow into uh, for future opportunities in their career. If people can be honest with themselves about that, uh, then you can start to achieve what you're describing. I, th I think to, about myself early on, I, I was one of those, I switched majors a bunch of times in college. Um, and largely a lot of what was driving that was kind of external pressures, like societal norms, family pressures, you know, what I thought other people's expectations for me were, right? And, and I was a good student. So I pretty much did well in, in all the different um, majors that I had switched to. But I'm so glad I didn't end up in any of those uh, that I'd started in. And for example, at one point, I was an accounting major uh, at, a, at a really good school with a top, you know, top couple uh, ranked program in the country. I, if I would have graduated in that program, I would have been assured a, a good, well-paying job with a prestigious firm, probably for the rest of my career. Um, and I was good at accounting. The problem was I hated it. And so, you know, the deeper I got into the program, uh, the more and more I realized like being good at this and the fact that it's kind of would be seen as prestigious and other people think it's a good thing for me to do and blah, blah, blah. Despite all of that, I would have hated it. Um, I, I can't imagine like doing that all day, every day. Now, do I do things that are related to those, the skills I learned in accounting? Yeah, I do. And I do some of that um, scattered throughout all the other stuff I do, but it's, it's really a small piece. Um, it's not your primary task. It's not my primary task. Yeah. It's not even close to it. And so while I have colleagues and friends who are accountants and they love their job and they love what they do, mm -hmm. like, I'm glad they found it for them. I'm glad right. I found my way out of that so that I didn't end up spending, you know, 20 years in a career and then having an existential crisis, you know, midlife and, and feeling like I needed to switch. And so I, I think what you're talking about in terms of alignment, it's, it's really important on both sides. It's important on the yeah. employee, on the employer side that I can be clear enough about what the needs are in my organization so that I can search for the people that will fit that need. Right. right. Um, that's, I, I know that sounds obvious, but that's really actually not very easy to do. Right. <laughs> um, right. That's, no, that's hard. That's hard to do. But on the other side, on the employee, on the employee side, 
I have to recognize who I am, what I want, what I need, what I'm going to be good at, um, and how I want to grow in my career, and then look for jobs that align with that. It, it's so tempting, especially I mean, right now we're in a tight labor market. And so employees have choices, uh, they can go lots of places. But that's not always the case. And if you're in a situation where maybe a, jo a, a job is hard to come by right now, you might be tempted to just jump at the first thing that comes your yeah. way. Yeah. And man, I, I get that that can help pay your bills in the short run, but in the long run, it could actually really hurt you and your career and your opportunities to, you know, provide for you or your family or whatever. Um, so we just have to be very, very cautious and very aware of this alignment issue on both sides of the equation. Yeah, let's take a, a, a different little different spin on that because something you said earlier fits right in really well with that. You were saying about how with the pandemic and all how uh, employers are having a real hard time getting employees now. What if they took the system I just described and had that be one of their primary um, points in the way they're advertising their positions that we help you find the position that you're going to love and want to stay in and we'll coach you through it. So you're coaching them through it because you want to find the right person, but you're also helping them with their own career, helping them find the right place for themselves. And that's a lot of the reason why people have left their jobs. They've realized that life is too short. Look at all that's going on around us. I don't want to be in this for the rest of my life. So if you as an employer can get your advertising out correctly, that you're going to help them, you're not looking just to pull in anyone, you're looking to help them find the right spot and the right career and the right path for them, and you will help coach them through that. It'll help both of you at the same time, and you may get perfect or close, nobody's perfect, close to perfect match of the type of employee you're looking for, and they'll get the job that they really wanted. Yeah, very well said. Um, and so I, I think, again, nothing that we're talking about here is rocket science. It's um, perhaps what many listeners may consider to be common sense, yet it, it's, it's hard to do in practice. Uh, and, and so let's talk about some of the practical things that need to happen in order for us uh, to do exactly what you're describing. And, and I also need to just note and and uh, reinforce what you said about if we want to attract and retain the best people, one of the best ways to do that is to have better alignment and for people who are applying for our jobs to know that this is something that's really important to us as a company in it, within our culture. And we're going to try to help you succeed by helping you land in the right type of position for you. Uh, that, that, that's, that's a big selling point for a lot of people, I think. Um, so let's talk about some of the practical aspects of, of how we go about even identifying what the true alignment is. Um, because, you know, I, I do a lot of work with companies, you know, where they have a post, they have a position open. Uh, and let's assume we're not talking about a really small business right now. Maybe it's, you know, 50 or more employees, still small or medium size, all the way up to large size companies. Um, you know, it can be really challenging to know what somebody is doing uh, day in and day out in a role. And a lot of times an opening uh, you know, someone leaves for whatever reason, you have this new opening for a position. A lot of times companies just recycle old job postings and they may not have updated a job description or a job posting in, in uh, years so at some point. You know, I've worked with organizations where they hadn't updated um, uh, job descriptions in like a decade. And I mean, how many people are doing the same things in a job, you know, 10 years later that they were, you know, a decade ago? That, that nobody's doing that, right? There's so many shifts. And so just st staying on top of all of that is a hard thing. And it's something I think a lot of mid-sized to large organizations really struggle with. They don't even know what people are really doing or what, you know, there, there's kind of all of this unwritten, these unwritten norms, these unwritten uh, agreements about who's doing what. And how do you get past that to the point where now I can actually say, I have this vacancy, I'm going to, I know what we need and I'm going to go out and frame, you know, a job search and a recruitment uh, practice in order to actually get those people. 
Great question. And I had a really good system for that. And I still do. And I coach businesses on how to do exactly that. So whether you have two employees or 100 employees, this system would work really well for you. So as a small employer, when I first started hiring people, my first concern was exactly that. What if tomorrow my key person left? I'm busy doing what I do. I can't then train somebody and hire someone and know everything that they did too. And my brain can only hold just so much and there's only so many hours of the day. So how could you possibly keep on top of four or five, six, 10 or 50 employees? So I developed a way that we managed the office so that I didn't have to. Each employee, when they were first hired, were given what their tasks are. And it was their job all of our computers were networked. So you could see one person's work from another person's work. And each employee is required to have a manual on how they do all of the tasks of their job. And it was their job. Part of their job was to keep that manual up to date. And I went over it with the employees or I had the people that I businesses that I coach, I had their manager or the owner, if it was a small enough company, go over those at least monthly or quarterly and look and see what those people are doing and are they keeping it up to date. So some of those manuals, some of the things that those manuals, I should say, included were not just the tasks that they do, but all their key contacts. So when they're, if they're the ones required to, let's say, maintain all the computer systems, who do they go to when they have technology issues? Who do they go to when that person isn't the next one, isn't helping them? And all of the connections they have all have to be documented in their own manual that is shared on the computer. I wanted it that if any employee at any time was out sick or up and left, someone else could just pull up that manual and know exactly what that employee was doing, how they did it, who their contacts were, and it, it'll take some time to get them up and running, but at least they have what they need to be able to do that. And if you're a really small business owner and only had two or three employees and something happened and they were gone, or let's say COVID, they were all out sick, and you had to do the tasks, could you even do them? If they've been working for you for any length of time, odds are you've switched your focus to bringing money into the business, servicing your clients, marketing, that kind of thing. And you're not doing any of those other tasks and you probably haven't been for years. So if you had to step back in, could you even do it? Well, it's the same thing if you're a larger mid-sized company and you needed to bring somebody new in. If you have a system already in place that you could plug them into, sit them in front of the computer, say, here's how it's done. This is what you need to train yourself on. And then we'll have someone helping you from there. It would make it so much easier to onboard anyone. And it'll make their onboarding easier for them. They'll like the job better because you've got everything documented. You're organized and you know what you're doing and you're helping them to know what they need to do to do a good job. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that really is a hard thing when people come into a new organization, into a new role, and there's always a learning curve. And it's frustrating for people when you're spending a lot of time just trying to understand the basic nuts and bolts of like how to go about doing a job. Um, there's no reason why someone should have to start from scratch in doing that when they're in a new position. Um, and so being able to share institutional knowledge in a more formal way, like, like what you're describing, is a really great approach. Uh, just so so people have something to go to. And, and if you're lucky, if you're a big enough organization, you know, you might have other people in the office who can assist and, you know, either do some shadowing or train, you know, some some on the job training and you go and ask this person a question. But you don't always have that luxury, especially if you're a smaller business. Right. You may be the only, you know, you're in a new role. You may be the only person doing that role. And if you just have to literally just figure it all out from scratch and you don't even have anyone to ask, um, I mean, how much time and energy and money are you wasting as an organization if that's happening? And so, and to your earlier point, it, that's just a recipe for disengagement and dissatisfaction <laughs> among employees yeah. because people don't like to work in that environment. 
Exactly. If you could make it easy for them to do their job well, they'll like being there more and you'll get more done and you'll get it done efficiently and effectively. So it's a win-win for both sides. Yeah. And when, and when we can do this all, you know, take an, a strategic approach to our hiring and our staffing within our organization, uh, when we think about the core values of the organization, when we think about and are really clear-eyed about what the gaps are and the needs are of the organization in terms of knowledge, skills, ability, um, competencies, and capabilities of, of future team members, you know, if we can have all of that as a foundation, for who we are, what we're trying to accomplish. And then we take that out into the recruitment process through job postings, through, you know, whether we're working with a firm to, to, uh, to headhunt people or whatever our approach is to get good talent. Um, when we have all that foundation there, that then, you know, just really dramatically increases the potential of us finding people that aren't just like good on paper, um, yeah. that's not necessarily always a hard thing to find, you know, people that have the credentials, people that kind of check the boxes, exactly. but we're, we're talking about something that's much more than checking boxes. Uh, we're talking about values alignment, culture fit. We're talking about um, just, I mean, even like life stage fit um, because some jobs just are going to be a better fit for people depending on what they want and need. And those wants and needs shift over time as we're in different life stages. And so just being very understanding about all of that. And then, you know, tailoring the search process, the, the recruitment process, the screening process, the hiring process, the interviewing, all the stuff that goes into getting those people onto the team, we, we can focus on alignment to those core values, those core principles, the, the real core needs of the organization and what this person can do to make a meaningful contribution each and every day. So they don't just feel like they're spinning their wheels, doing busy work, whatever, but they can feel fulfilled yeah. in the work that they do. When we do all of that, you know what? Word spreads quickly. People want to work for companies that have their stuff together. Uh, people yeah. want to work for companies where they feel needed, valued, and fulfilled. And word of mouth will start to spread. Uh, you'll get a better reputation and people will start to look to work for you and you'll be able to attract better people. You'll be able to retain people. So you don't have to have as many vacancies that need to be filled. And, it, and ultimately that just leads to more productive, more innovative organizations. It's going to help the bottom lines of the company. You're absolutely right. There's a phrase that I heard that I always took to heart, hire for personality, train for skill. If they have a bad attitude, if they don't like the job, if they don't have the right personality, then they're not going to be good for the position. I'd rather hire someone that has a great personality, is eager to learn, wants to do a good job, has that kind of personality, because I can train them on what to do. If they're reasonably knowledgeable or, or reason, if they're reasonable people and have a great personality, I can train them what to do. Sometimes I even hired people with no skill in what I was hiring them for because their attitude and their drive and their, I mean, I knew they'd get along well with everyone. I knew they were smart. I knew they wanted to learn and suck up everything they could get in their head that it would be easy to train them quickly on such easy tasks that I was gonna be giving them. But the personality is what matters because you can't change who a person is but you can teach them if they want to learn. And so hire for personality, train for skill. Yeah. And I might um, even adjust that slightly. And depending on what you mean by personality, you know, personality in terms of introversion, extroversion traits, and, you know, those sorts of things, I'm not sure always even matter that much either. But what I'm hearing you say, I would frame probably more like um, outlook and mindset. Um in, in approach to life and to work. And so if I have someone, if I have someone who has an abundance mindset, someone who has a growth mindset where they they're excited to be there, they're excited to contribute, they're excited to learn, they're excited to grow. Um, you know, that's what I want. And, and ultimately those are the people that are going to, going to help you be successful. Um, and so, yeah, absolutely. We want to hire for those types of things and make sure that we're getting, uh, you know, people in the door, that ultimately are going to be uh, happy with what we're trying to accomplish as a business. 
Right. Because if they don't have that kind of attitude within them, it's not going to make for a good work environment. And no one's going to be happy. Yeah. Well, Nancy, it has been a real pleasure talking with you today. The time has flown by. Uh, yes. Before we close, though, I wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you and find out more about your business. And then give us the final word on the topic for today. Okay. Um, so you can connect with me. My website is aboveallelse.org. Cell phone number 860-444-0535. And in closing, I know it's tough times in hiring people right now, but if you put out there and show them the kind of culture you have and that you're not there just to get bodies in the door, but you're there to help them make a good career choice for themselves, you'll be more apt to get people to want to work for you. Well said. Thank you so much, Nancy. It's been a pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Nancy can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week.